All right, hello everybody. It's Dr. Alex Earl. We're here at Pure Plastic Surgery today, and it's Hump Day with Dr. Alex Earl. All right, this is the time we get to spend with each other and learn about plastic surgery related topics, uh, and of course, answer any of uh, any and all of your burning questions. Okay. Uh, today, I think we have a very interesting topic that, that I like to talk about. I think it's going to allow people to really understand, you know, how some of uh, these surgeries work. Um, and of course, today I want to talk about fat physiology, okay? Uh, so this is going to help you understand like how a BBL works, how fat transfer works, okay? And uh, and then why, you know, it's such a, I would say such a kind of a powerful uh, procedure because you can really, really alter the shape of someone's body uh, with a combination of liposuction and fat transfer, okay? So kind of, we're going to dig into that a little bit. We're going to talk about that for a few minutes. And then of course, afterwards, I'll be happy to answer any questions you guys may have, okay? All right, so fat physiology. So pretty much how fat works. That's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and so the first thing that we need to know is that once you become an adult, okay, the number of fat cells in a certain area and the distribution of fat cells doesn't really change, okay? So as you're growing up, you know, as you're a kid growing up, it can change and they do multiply uh, to a certain extent, okay? And that's why it's so important that your kids, you know, remain healthy and that they eat healthy and they don't become obese as kids, okay? Um, because then that is just gonna, you know, last, you know, with them pretty much their entire lives, okay? So, you know, all the moms out there, you know, really focusing, you know, having healthy diets for kids, making sure that they're active, uh, doing exercise and everything else. Uh, so that they have a very balanced fat distribution, okay? Uh, but the point is that once you get to about 18 or so, um, the number of fat cells that you have in your body and where those fat cells are located is pretty much permanent, okay? You can't really change that with further diet or exercise, okay? The only way to really change that is to physically remove fat from a certain area and transplant it to a different area, okay? But what does change in adulthood, obviously, is size, the size of the fat cell. So size does matter, okay? So if you start, you know, putting in the calories, not going to the gym, okay, Pr pretty much, you know, taking in more calories than you're burning, some of that gets, you know, your body will kind of, you know, in a nutshell, transfer it to fat, and the size of those fat cells will begin to grow, okay? So that's when, so when you're overweight and you're obese, it's not that you, you actually accumulated more fat cells, is that the fat cells that you have became larger, okay? So that's what happens in adults. So, so size is what changes as an adult based on your diet and exercise program, okay? So, so when you have an excess of fat in a certain area, okay, and diet and exercise is not helping, okay, then really the only way to then, you know, address the area is to physically remove those fat cells, okay? And of course, the way that we do that is via liposuction, right? So when you do liposuction, you're physically removing the number of fat cells in a certain area. Uh, and then if you need to, you know, fill a certain area, okay, then the only way to be able to do that is to transplant more fat cells to those air, to that area, okay? That's why, you know, you always get these kind of asinine comments like, oh, she should, she could have done that at the gym. Well, guess what? No, for, um, for the most part, you can't. Yeah, at the gym, muscle can grow, but fat will not grow, okay? The gym does not affect the, necessarily the growth of fat cells or the multiplication of fat cells, okay? So if, say, for example, and you'll see this, you'll see this in runners and very fit people, they tend to have hip dips and they tend to be kind of very kind of straight up and down, pretty rectangular, okay? Um, and no amount of like further dieting and exercise is gonna change that. The only way to fill a hip dip um, is to transplant fat to that area, okay? Why is that? Because actually the muscle, the shape of the muscle, the gluteal muscle on the side is actually kind of, you know, concave, all right? So if you wanna pop that out, and you want that nice roundness, you can have a nice hourglass figure, Really, the only way to do that is with uh, fat transfer, okay? And sometimes it takes more than one, you know, because the blood supply to that area is not great, so not all the fat's gonna survive. And if you really wanna change, you know, achieve a certain shape, uh, then sometimes you need, you know, more than one procedure to do so. All right, so that's, 
That, but the one thing, the one little small caveat in all this is that along with, with the fat cells, you have also a small amount of what we call stem cells, okay? Now stem cells are these cells that could eventually become any other cell in your body, one of which of course is fat. So there is a certain, a certain number of stem cells. It's, very, it's the minority of cells, but they are present uh, in that fat uh, that we harvest, okay? All right, so, so what we've learned so far is, okay, the number of fat cells and the distribution of fat cells doesn't change after you're an adult, okay? At least not, not on its own. Okay, what does change is the size of the fat cells, okay? And the only way to kind of redistribute fat cells is to do it via liposuction and fat transfer, okay? And that's essentially what a BBL is, all right? So we always get the question, and some people are like, I don't understand, why is he asking me then to gain weight? I mean, if if I'm not gonna get any more fat cells, uh, you know, Dr. O, you just said you're not gonna get more fat cells, then why are you asking me to gain weight? That makes no sense to me now. Okay, great question, I'm glad you asked. Uh, so the reason is because harvesting the fat cells is easier when they're bigger, okay? So we have a cannula, a cannula is a certain size, certain holes in that cannula, okay? And of course, um, it is much, much easier to harvest large fat cells than small fat cells. Okay, just, I don't know, think about anything. You know, you're trying to grab a tennis ball versus a basketball. That's pretty much what it comes down to, okay? So it's a lot easier to, to basically grab a large fat cell than a small fat cell, and that's why we sometimes ask our patients to gain weight. It's not because we think they're gonna be creating more fat cells, it's because they're easier to harvest, okay? So if they're easier to harvest, then there's more fat cells that we can then transfer. So that's the whole point about gaining weight prior to BBL if your BMI is too low, okay? I, I hope that makes sense now. All right, so then when we do that, we remove, we permanently remove cells from a certain area and we permanently add cells to a different area, okay? Then we basically permanently redistributed the fat cells in your body, okay? Um, and what happens is, you know, when we do the BBL, initially, you know, we, we put, you know, that, you know, certain volume of fat into, into the buttock, which could be whatever, a thousand cc, 1500 cc, okay, per side. Um, but of course, we know that there's a little bit of fluid in there as well, and we also know there's gonna be some swelling. So at the very, very beginning, your, the volume, this is the volume here, the volume seems very, very high, okay, in the buttock area. And then what happens is that you're gonna lose some of that inflammation, some of that fluid is gonna get absorbed, and not all of those fat cells are gonna survive, okay? All right, it's like any transplant, you know, they need an adequate blood supply, they need a, a good, basically, living space to survive, okay? And so not all of them are survive, and some are gonna die. And some of the ones that die get reabsorbed by the body. If unfortunately a clump of them dies and kind of sticks together, that's what's called fat necrosis. So necrosis stands for death, so dead fat cells that come together and form a little scar ball. Okay, that's what fat necrosis is, okay? Um, and of course, uh, you know, hopefully the majority of them will survive. So in my practice, I, uh, you know, given all patients, I estimate that the fat loss rate is about 30% and the fat survival rate therefore is about 70%, okay? So, so I starts to come down, some of these fat cells start to die off, things get to the name, you keep a low point. There's typically a low point somewhere around six weeks. It can be a little bit before, it can be a little bit later, but the average is about six weeks, okay? You're gonna hit a low point there, all right? And then, from that low point, you're gonna go into what we call fluff phase, okay? Fluff phase is when some of these stem cells that I just mentioned, some of these stem cells differentiate into fat cells. Okay, and they add to some of the fat cells that you, that you have there already that got transplanted and they start to fluff out. And then you go through that fluff phase somewhere around three months, okay? Could be a little later, could be four months, could be six months, depends on the patient. But somewhere around that time, you go into that fluff phase. The, the volume here, the height of this volume here is not gonna be as high as initial, but it's certainly gonna be lower than that, that low point there, okay? Um, and then, yeah, you go into that fluff phase. Now, so many patients ask, well, what can we do to help with that? How can I kind of try to assure that um, most of my fat cells survive uh, and the ones that do survive are kind of, you know, are healthy? So, of course, we, you know, we try to minimize pressure to the area. 
uh, especially in the initial six weeks until they get fully revascularized, okay? So you wanna minimize pressure to the area for the first six weeks, okay? Uh, but the other thing that we, that we highly, highly recommend is feeding the fat, okay? So we wanna basically create a diet and healthy fats, okay, that will feed these fat cells and allow them to like not only survive, but plump up, okay? Because remember what we said at the very beginning, what does change is size. So with the surgery, we change the number of fat cells and the distribution, that's surgery, okay? And then with diet, you can change the size, that's diet, okay? So we say, in the, especially in the first six weeks, which is where you're gonna go into that low point, but even after, okay, you wanna increase the size of those brand new fat cells in those areas where you really want them, um, you wanna feed the fat. So what does that mean? What are the foods that we recommend to feed the fat? So I wrote a list here, I'm, uh, hopefully you guys can see it there. And if you do take a screenshot and you have this list with you, um, but it's eggs, okay, peanut butter, avocado. Avocado is a super fruit, okay? You can have one of, you know, at least one a day. Um, you have nuts, okay, macadamia nuts. Uh, I have a lot, of good, a, lot, a lot of healthy fats. Olive oil, of course, just kind of drench everything in the olive oil. Um, and then in terms of, you know, the, the fish with the high omega-3 fatty acids, such as salmon, uh, shrimp has a good amount of healthy fats as well. Has a, a fair amount of cholesterol too, so, so be a little careful with the shrimp, okay? Uh, but here's the fun part. Milk products, yes, what everyone's been waiting for. Yeah, you got your cheese, but you got your ice cream and your milkshakes too, okay? So yeah, that's the time to eat a whole bunch of ice cream and milkshakes and you wanna feed the fat, okay? So these are the, the foods that you should take, you know, as you're recovering uh, from your fat transfer procedure, okay? So the last thing that I wrote here is the gym is not going to help. It's not going to help with changing the number of fat cells, okay? And it's not going to help with changing the distribution of fat cells, okay? Because uh, that's the, the only way to do that is with liposuction and fat transfer, okay? It can change to a certain degree the size of the fat cells. Of course, if you work out a lot, you burn a lot of calories, those fat cells become smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's why um, we do not recommend like like heavy cardio type of workouts after BBL, okay? Like long distance running, marathon running, things like that. Okay, that's gonna shrink your fat cells everywhere. It's gonna shrink your fat cells in the buttock as well. Um, so we don't recommend that. If it, but what we do recommend is, is the type of exercise is gonna help continue to build the area. So, uh, so weight training, whether it's actual weights or body weight, okay? That's gonna help. So squats will help because squats will build the muscle they won't necessarily shrink the fat cells over to, over top of that, and so overall, the, you know, the butter can you know remain with that nice pleasing uh, shape. Okay, um, and so and then the other, and if you do want to do like something, you know, in terms of you know trying to get your heart rate up, then we recommend um, high intensity interval training. Okay, so weight training and hit training is the type of exercise you want to do after BBL to try to maintain your results. Okay. Um, but the cool thing is that, you know, because a lot of women are also they're like, well, you know, if I really start eating a lot um, after surgery, when we're, we're kind of in this feed the fat phase, um, you know, they're afraid that they're just going to kind of get fat everywhere. But remember, we've permanently, we have permanently um, decreased the amount of fat cells in certain areas. So we did, typically, of course, it's the torso. So um, you have a less number of fat cells in your abdomen, your planks, and your waist, and your back. Uh, and you have more fat cells now in the hip and the buttocks. So when you when you feed the fat, okay, and you and you start to, and you gain perhaps a little bit of weight, it's gonna go more now, more so now to the hips and the buttock, and less to the to the torso region, okay. Uh, so that's the upside. Now the downside is, of course, you you don't want to overdo it, right? You start to overdo it, it, the fat will also start to grow in other areas that are not desirable, okay. And the one area, and now hopefully you guys got all that already, okay? We will save it. The one area where we don't want a lot of fat accumulation is what we call the visceral fat, okay? So, okay, this is kind of, uh, this is your breast, this is your tummy, your belly button, okay? Now here's your abdominal wall, and this is where all your organs are, okay? The visceral fat is a fat that's deep in there where the organs are, okay? Um, 
that's the visceral fat. That's the fat that we, that there, there is no surgical solution to that other than bariatric surgery, okay? That's the fact that there, there's no tummy tug, no, you can't do anything. It's with where the organs are, okay? And if that fat starts to grow, then your belly will become like this, protuberant, okay? Almost like a pregnancy type of belly, okay? Uh, because you have that internal fat growing there, okay? So you definitely don't want to overdo it. So I always recommend uh, for my patients, you know, when they go into the kind of the feed the fat phase, um, to certainly, at the very least, maintain their weight. You definitely do not want to be losing your weight, okay? You want to, at the very least, maintain your weight, but perhaps you want to gain, say, about five pounds or so, okay? And that's about right. You want to gain about five pounds. I mean, if you really want to push it, maybe 10, but that, that would be the absolute max, okay? You don't want to overdo it. You, want, you don't want to get into like 15, 20, 25 pounds. That's, then, then the distribution is going to go all wrong, okay? Then you're going to be getting into visceral fat, you're going to be getting uh, increasing the fat in perhaps areas that were in lipo, like for example, say arms or thighs or um, I don't know near the knees or any area that wasn't you know addressed. Um, so you you want to be careful with that. Okay. All right. Well, I think that kind of explains things uh, you know in a nutshell. So I'll be happy to take any questions. We have a lot of questions. First, All right. when you're performing a BBL and you transfer the same amount of fat in each cheek. Is it rare to see one cheek lose fat cells versus the other and have an uneven result? Yeah, so that's a great question. So yeah, for, for the most part, for most patients, um, they're starting off with cheeks that are relatively similar. And so the amount of fat transfer that we do to each, each cheek is, each cheek, excuse me, um, is also, the volume is relatively the same. So for most patients, I would say, you know, I do like 50, for example, 1500 on the right side, 1500 on the left, okay? So the second part of the question is, can you lose more fat on one side than another? Yes, it is possible. It is possible and it depends on many, many things. You know, there's many factors that could affect it. Uh, you know, was there more pressure for whatever reason on one side or the other? Like was the faha tighter on one side or the other? Did the patient kind of sleep a little bit more on one side than the other? Um, you know, all these things that could potentially affect it. Um, so I think, that, so the, the upside to, to a BBL the upside to that surgery is it's a very powerful surgery and it's the only way to change the number and distribution of fat cells in the body. The downside to a BBL is that it's not as predictable as say many of our other surgeries. So for example, a breast augmentation is very, very predictable. It's almost scientific. You know, you look at the patient, you look at the dressage, you take specific measurements, you choose the implant and you can very well kind of predict how things are gonna look. Uh, another one is, a, say, for example, a tummy tuck. A tummy tuck is fairly predictable as well. Um, you know, there's excess skin, and you're going to remove all that excess skin, and you can pretty much anticipate how things will look then. Um, unfortunately, fat survival, okay, is not as predictable. There's many, many factors that go into that that are out of a surgeon's control. So, you know, there's the quality of the fat, there is the patient's genetics, there is a post-op care. Was there pressure? Was there not any pressure? Um, there's the faha, was it appropriate faha, inappropriate faha, uh, too much pressure, etc. etc. Did they feed the fat, did they not feed the fat? Um, so there's all these these variables, okay, that unfortunately make the BBL less predictable, which is why it's one of the surgeries that has a higher revision rate. So, you know, in my practice, so in well in in the nation, you know, pretty much uh, you know, international, national, international numbers, all everyone put together putting all their data together, the revision rate for BBL is somewhere between 10 to 15%, okay? So it's fairly high. The revision rate, I just, you know, as in comparison, say the revision rate for a breast dog is much, much lower. It's, you know, somewhere like in like 2% or something like that, okay? So and the reason for that is, you know, everything I just described. So what if my butt is soft two weeks post-op? Did my fat die? Uh, not necessarily. No, I wouldn't say that it died. Um, and I, I definitely wouldn't get, you know, you know, depressed or anything at that point in time. So remember, um, for the first, you know, three months, it's similar to that graph that I just drew, um, you're going to go into that physical and emotional roller coaster. Okay. Uh, so you're going to have good days and up days and ups and downs and, you know, things are going to change continuously. But what you have to focus on is not so much at kind of looking at yourself in the mirror and nitpicking every little thing, you know, during that time, 
What you have to focus on is your recovery. You have to focus on doing all the right things, okay? So wearing the appropriate compression, having the proper massage, having the proper diet, feeding the proper fat in the way that we just described, okay? Those are the things that you have to focus on and not so much whether, oh, I think it's one there is, you know, one hip is dying more than the other or all, all of a sudden it's soft or it's not soft enough or, you know, or, you know, all these things or, uh, you know, there's a little skin laxity and a little unevenness there and the skin's not retracting back, okay? You just have, don't, don't try to focus and kind of nitpick at yourself so much with those things, but do focus on the things that count, okay? So where the appropriate compression Use your phones, use your boards, make sure you have a very experienced post lipo massage therapist that can help you with all these things. And if they need to, they can bring some, you know, other things into the, into the mix that can help your results, such as, you know, cavitation, wood therapy, ultrasound therapy, all, you know, these types of things. Okay. Uh, and of course, and then, and feeding the fat in the diet. Thank you. So you just said use your phones and boards. This question is about a mommy makeover. Are okay. foam are foam boards recommended with faja or no? Post For the mommy makeover, um, you typically don't need a board, uh, but sometimes a foam can help. Okay, and really. So what's the purpose of the foams? The purpose of the foams, for the most part, is to prevent any creasing that can happen from either a binder or a faja. Okay. So you know, fajas don't tend to be perfectly kind of smooth sometimes, especially if you're kind of sitting and things kind of wrinkle up underneath there. But the foam kind of prevents. Uh, that from you know creating a crease in your skin okay so that's the point of the foams that's why they're so important and that can be helpful with the mind makeover as well can i still get at the earl curve with lipo 360 only uh yeah if you have naturally rounded hips okay because it's part of the curve is 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 of course that hip area so it's basically how things come in from from the you know the flanks to kind of just below the armpit area as they flow down into the waist and then as they come out into that hip area creating that nice kind of hourglass curve there so if you already have you know a fairly nice fairly rounded hip and then what we need is just to address the rest of it then it is possible to do that um, with light bulb up. question about implants i have natural silicone breast implants they've been in since 2010 do you recommend changing it uh, so my question to you would be, are they textured or not? Okay. If they're textured, I definitely recommend say, changing them. Okay. You definitely want to be changing textured implants. Those are the ones that have been demonstrated to be uh, associated with a, a very rare lymphoma. Uh, it's called ALCL. Um, but, uh, but if you have textured implants, I do recommend exchanging them for smooth implants. Now, if they're smooth implants, um, you've had them for 10 years and you have really no problems with them whatsoever, everything feels fine, everything looks good, there's no caps or contracture or anything else going on, then no, there's no need to change them. You just kind of, you can let them be. So when can we start working out after a BBL and specifically when can we start running and doing cardio after a BBL? Right, so you can start working out um, at, after six weeks, okay? But at that point in time, pretty much whatever fat cells that we're gonna survive have survived, whatever fat cells that we're gonna die and get resorbed uh, have done so. Uh, at that point in time, okay? Uh, but the second part of your question, you know, remember, be careful with the cardio. I just kind of talked about mm -hmm. that a little bit. You don't want to be doing, you know, kind of long distance running, marathon running type of things. Uh, that's that's going to affect your results. You want to do more kind of the weights and the hit type of training. Okay, okay so then next is quick question about mommy makeover. How long should compression socks be worn after mommy makeover? Great, so that's a good question. So with the mommy makeover, the um what we worry about the most uh is dvts and pe's okay so dvt and pe so those are blood clots okay dvt stands for deep vein thrombosis and these are the clots that occur typically in the lower extremities okay and then the pe stands for pulmonary embolus okay a lot of times the clot that's in the that's a dvt that's in the lower extremity can dislodge and then go through your system end up in your lungs and that's a pulmonary embolus okay so the way to minimize the risk after a mommy makeover is that we do three things, three things, okay? One is your compression stockings, okay? Which is what the question was about, and you wanna wear that for at least a week, at least one week, okay? Two is your, what we call your SCD, which stands for a sequential compression device, okay? We have one here that we provide to all our mommy makeovers, it's called Circulate, 
And what it does is that it keeps the circulation in the legs moving, okay? So everyone who has a mental mind makeover here at Pure Plastic Surgery will get a circulate device because as you guys know, safety is our number one priority and we do everything that we can for our patients to try to minimize any risk, okay? Um, so that the patient's gonna wear whenever they're not active uh, or when at night when they're sleeping uh, and of course for, for their flights, you know, for any flight back home, okay? And then third, even though we're, we don't, we're doing this and we're doing this, that doesn't mean that you can be lazy, okay? We need you to walk. Walk is extremely, walking is extremely important, okay? So you still have to get up, you still have to walk around. You wanna be walking about 10 minutes every hour or so while awake, okay? You wanna keep your circulation moving um, and it's very, very important. Thank you, quickly. What's the oldest person that can have a BBL or tummy tuck with you? So our cutoff is 55, okay? Uh, I know as soon as I said that, a whole bunch of people there are like, what, 55? I know, I understand. Uh, but we do have to make a cutoff and after a certain age, um, the recovery just becomes a lot, lot tougher. And remember, we're doing this in an outpatient office-based surgery setting, okay? We're not in a hospital um, and we want to have your kind of your safety um, is our primary concern, okay? So in order to make sure that you're safe and to minimize any sort of surprises or anything like that, uh, we do have a cutoff age, which is 55. Will I lose weight in my face or other parts of my body after a BBO, or is this only happen with diet and exercise? Um, no, so, so, okay, let me kind of break that question down. First of all, liposuction um, is not a weight loss surgery, okay? Do not think of liposuction as weight loss surgery, okay? So liposuction is more basically body contouring or fat re redistribution uh, type of surgery, okay? Um, so if we do, you know, of course, liposuction and fat transfer, then from the areas that we did the liposuction, we're permanently removing the number of fat cells in that area, okay? And then if we do the fat transfer, we're permanently increasing the number of fat cells in the area that we transfer to. Areas that were not touched, you know, such as say, for example, we just worked on the torso, areas that were not touched, such as the face, they're gonna pretty much react the same they would otherwise. Um, except, you know, that now, it, now, it, it, you know, the, relatively it changes. So say, for example, let me, let me explain myself. So you never did liposuction, right? You gained 20 pounds. Well, you gained it in your face, you gained it in your, in your belly. Uh, and it kind of gains proportionately there, and that's kind of what you're used to most of your life, right? Say now you went in, you did liposuction, we removed a whole bunch of fat cells from your torso because that's your, that was your area of concern, okay? But now you gain 20 pounds. Well, you're not gonna gain as much in the belly anymore, and it's gonna look like you just gained it all in the face, okay? But you're, yeah, you're gonna gain it in the other areas where, the, where you still have those same number of fat cells. Okay, that's why you want to be very, very careful after a liposuction procedure. You want to really maintain a healthy lifestyle. Okay, people, you can't, you can't. It's not, a, it's not basically, you know, uh, the the ability then to just eat whatever you want afterwards. You want to maintain a healthy lifestyle. You want to, um, you know, continue to do your exercise, continue your healthy diet. You want to maintain your BMI or maintain your weight um, after a liposuction procedure. is very important. Thank you. How soon after a BBL can you get a breast on it? Uh, three months. So by three months, you know, everything should be settled. Um, you should be fairly recovered and then you can go ahead and do a, a separate, you know, a different procedure such as a breast augmentation. Do you recommend putting anything in the belly button during healing to shape it after a tummy tuck? Uh, I do, I do, but we gotta give that, that belly button some initial healing time, okay? So the minimum time would be at least two weeks. Uh, some, some belly buttons are ready at two weeks, some are not, and that's okay. Uh, but we want to make sure that that area is like fully healed uh, before then you start, you know, using the belly button trainer. So for some patients it might be two months, for some patients, I mean, I'm sorry, two weeks, uh, but for, for some patients it might be a month or so. Thank you. So this is a two-part question. My hemoglobin is 11.2. Will the cell saver automatically be used in my surgery? And is there a yeah. way to test your hemoglobin at home? So definitely uh, anyone who has a hemo level between uh, 11 and 12, you're still qualified for the surgery, but the cell saver is mandatory, okay? Um, regardless, even if your hemoglobin is higher, I, I, I always highly, highly recommend the cell saver. It is included as part of the package for all our patients getting a BBL or Lipo 360, even if your hemo level is 14, okay? Um, because it's really gonna make your recovery a lot, lot easier. 
Um, is there a way to check your chemo levels at home? Um, there's no easy way unless you actually buy a device, you know, uh, online. Uh, there's one that's called a chemo Q, um, and potentially you can, you, can, you can purchase one of those. It works with a, basically a finger stick. So you do a finger stick, you have a little drop of blood, you put that in, in the device and it can tell you a pretty good approximation of what your chemo level is. It's certainly not as accurate as say a CBC that we would draw you know, to, for an actual laboratory, but it gives you a pretty good, uh, pretty good estimate. Can I get a BBL or any surgery if I'm breastfeeding? Um, so you want to not be breastfeeding at the time of surgery, okay? Um, because your body does change once you stop breastfeeding, okay? So in order to get, say, a, a you know, better kind of baseline as to where you're starting and where you're gonna be, it's best to not be breastfeeding at the time of surgery. So if you're having, uh, and the other thing, if you're having a breast surgery, is that you want all those milk thugs to be closed. The milk thugs that are open can lead to infection and other issues. So if you're breastfeeding and you're gonna have a breast surgery, such as a breast dog or breast lip or anything else, um, you wanna stop breastfeeding for at least six months prior to a breast surgery. Um, if you are not, uh, if it's not a breast surgery, excuse me, you're breastfeeding but you're having a BBL, then I think three months is, added, is enough time to allow your body to kind of resettle after you're done breastfeeding. Can you test my skin laxity prior to surgery and know if after my Lipo360 BBL I'll have loose skin? So, so a certain degree you can. So um, that's one of the things I'll do with pre-op. So I would kind of, you know, take a look at the skin, the skin quality, the skin elasticity, uh, and then you know whether I think, you know, uh, it's gonna retract well, or it may not retract well, and you're gonna be, need some sort of skin tightening procedure afterwards. Skin tightening procedure can be anything from, say, body tight if it's mild, uh, to, say, a mini tummy tuck if it's kind of mild to moderate. Uh, but anything more than that, certainly moderate, severe, it's going to require a tummy tuck to really address uh, the skin laxity issue. Do B12 shots after a BBL help maintain keeping the fat? Um, you know, I haven't seen any, any literature or evidence for that. Um, B12, I mean, I, there's, I don't know, there's nothing wrong with it. I don't think, I don't see a downside. Um, but I don't know that it will actually uh, help a fat survive. And when can you have surgery after giving birth? Um, so again, so you want to wait at least six months, okay? Your body again is going to go through a lot of changes um, after giving birth, perhaps plus minus breastfeeding, you know, hormonal changes and everything else. So you want a lot of things to settle. Um, so you want to wait at least at least six months. Can you tighten my skin during a BBL surgery? The only way we can do that during the BBL is with the body to body tight, okay? Um, so if you have, like I said, mild, you know, mild skin laxity, mild to moderate skin laxity. Uh, then the body type can be added during the BBL to help with that. Um, or if you, if it's an area where you just don't want to have a scar, like say the arms or the thighs, where a lot of people they don't want that kind of long, kind of very visible, uh, you know, some a lot of oftentimes ugly looking scar. Um, and so they rather go for something like the body type, where you know you're not, you're not going to get as you know the 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 results aren't going to be as drastic as say a lift, um, but it's gonna be a nice change and you're gonna avoid that scar. So that's another reason to use you know, the body type at the time of life or BBL. Can I keep my IUD in during a BBL surgery? Uh, yeah, so IUD is okay. Um, even if, if they have progesterone, that's okay. So the one thing that's not okay is, is oral estrogens, okay? Or any, any sort of estrogen uh, type of medication. So you don't wanna be on anything that has estrogen during the time of surgery because it increases your chance of blood clots, which increases your DV, you know, chance for your DVTs and PEs. Thank you. Okay. Which do you recommend, saline or silicone implants? So in general, I recommend silicone implants and I gotta say that over 90% of the implants that I place are, are silicone implants, okay? Uh, probably even over 95%. Uh, I think silicone implants are much more durable they have a much, much um, softer look and feel, uh, and I do highly, highly recommend them. Today's implants are fifth generation implants, what are sometimes referred to as gummy bear implants. They have a highly cohesive gel. They retain their shape and form. They're, they're not you know, liquid, so even if you were to cut them in half, they would retain that shape. Um, and they're, they're just as safe, equally safe to saline implants and a better result overall. So, in general, I recommend a silicone implant. When can you sit after a BBL? 
So I like my veins to wait six weeks, okay, before like fully sitting on their butt. So for the first two weeks, you know, try not to sit at all or minimize sitting as much as you can. Uh, if you have to sit briefly for transitions for a few minutes, things like that, that's not going to be a, a huge problem, you know. Uh, but uh, after the first two weeks, then you can start using the BBL pillow, okay? So you use the BBL pillow, uh, you can use that pretty liberally up until you get to week six, and then at week six, you can d ditch the BBL pillow and just sit normal. What's the weight limit on getting a BBL? So we don't necessarily have a weight limit, but we do have a BMI limit, okay? So the BMI limit um, was 33.5, uh, but I am thinking of lowering it, lowering that. So I'm, I'm strongly considering uh, lowering that BMI limit uh, a bit more. Uh, but there is definitely a BMI limit for liposuction and BPO. Do you work out of a hospital for higher risk patients? So potentially it can. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit more, uh, there's a lot more organization that goes into it. Um, and the costs are significantly higher because the hospital fees are so high, uh, unfortunately. Um, so they charge uh, a lot for using their facilities, they charge a lot for using their anesthesia providers. Um, so sometimes the costs are about double um, what it would be uh, here in the clinic. What happens if the skin is too tight for a BBL? So a lot of times what happens is the, the, the amount of fat that we can transfer uh, becomes limited, okay? Because that becomes one of our rate limiting steps. So the skin um, is like a spring. There's, there's some spring to it. That's what we call the skin elasticity. But it does get to a point where that skin just can't, you know, it can't stretch any further. And when it does that, it becomes, you know, pretty tense. And the pressure underneath, underneath that skin starts to build up. Um, and even if you try to put more fat into that area, uh, the pressure is so high that as soon as you take the cannula out, the fat just kind of shoots right back out, okay? Um, also, you don't want to overdo it because if that pressure is high, that means that the blood supply is less. That means that the chances of the fat not surviving or becoming fat necrosis um, is also higher, okay? So you don't want to overdo it. And if you really go like crazy on it, uh, potentially that skin cannot survive well. Okay, so there's many, many reasons why you don't want to push it too far. Um, so the bottom line is, if you have tight skin, we're only going to be able to go so far. Okay, and then we're going to allow you to heal and everything else, and then allow that skin to kind of soften up again. And then you're probably looking at another round. So you probably need more than one round to really kind of pop out an area that has tight skin. Thank you very much. So we're pushing 40 minutes. You want to knock out a few more questions? All right, we got We have a lot. Two, two more. Three more. All right, three more. <laughs> Can I get a Lipo 360 BBL with mild to moderate scoliosis? Can the cannula yeah. puncture the spine in any way? No, no. So if you have scoliosis, you're, you're certainly a candidate still, and that's okay. Um, no, the cannula should not be anywhere near your actual spine, okay? Uh, remember, the cannula is superficial. It's between the skin and the muscles in that fat layer, what we call a superficial fat layer, okay? Um, but my, and my only caveat is, you know, if you have scoliosis, that means that your spine is off, that means that your pelvis is probably tilted, okay? So there's only so much that we can do. If you have a pelvic tilt, if you have a certain degree of scoliosis, you're gonna have asymmetries uh, from side to side. Uh, the truth is everyone does, whether they have a, a visible scoliosis or not. But you're gonna have more of an asymmetry and there's really only so much we can do with uh, liposuction and fat transfer to try to balance things out. So you just have to be aware of it. It's just the way you're built and that's fine. Uh, but you're not gonna be perfectly symmetrical side to side. All right, next question. How long do I have to wear my faja after a BBL? All right, so first six weeks, you're gonna wear that faja night and day, night and day. You're gonna take it off just to shower to wash it. Okay, if you need a short break, you know, some, some patients just, just, they just need like an hour or two, that's okay. You can take a short break and then put it back on. But for the most part, in the first six weeks, you're gonna wear that night and day. And then between week six and three months, you're gonna scale that to, down to about 12 hours a day. So it's typically best to wear it, you know, during the daytime when you're being active, you're moving around. Uh, and then at night when you go to bed, you can remove everything and be nice and comfortable and sleep throughout the night without it, okay? And you'll do that, to, like I said, so you get to about three months. And then after three months, uh, you know, it becomes more variable. Some, a lot of patients will stop at that point in time. They're kind of just sick and tired of wearing that faja uh, and they can stop. No, but there are patients that want to continue. And so I've seen patients, you know, continue to wear the faja for six months, even up to a year. 
Uh, but that's more of like, like a, a personal patient preference at that point. All right, for the last question. All right, make a good one. <laughs> do, my, do my best. What does what does A one C have to be in order to have surgery? Oh, good question. Okay, so what is A one C? It's called it's called the hemoglobin A one C, which is kind of a funny name because it has really not much to do with your hemo level at all. But for whatever you know, it's called that. Uh, so hemoglobin A one C. Okay. Do not think of this as anything to do with your hemo or iron levels. This is completely separate. Okay. But what it does measure is pretty much an average of what your glucose levels have been in your system and your blood for over the past, you know, approximately month or so. Okay. So it is especially important for diabetics, uh, type one and type two diabetics and pre-diabetics as well. Okay. A normal, a normal is somewhere around 5.5. Okay. So certainly if you're 5.5 or below, that's considered normal and you're good to go. All right. Now we accept, we accept up to 6.5. Okay. So yeah, it's a little bit higher than normal, but it's not completely out of control. So if you're a diabetic and you have 6.5 or below, you're still good to go. That's good enough for surgery. Okay. So we accept that if it's higher than 6.5, that's a problem. Okay. That's a problem because that means that your glucose levels are not well controlled. And when your glucose level is not well controlled, that means you have an increased risk of infection and you have an increased risk of the wounds not healing well. Okay. So, uh, wounds not healing, open wounds, um, you know, things like that. So, uh, especially for like big, big surgeries, you know, like, uh, like a tummy tuck, um, Okay, if that, if that uh, glucose is not under control, there ch the chances of a patient with, uh, getting a tummy tuck that their wound, you know, basically dehisses or opens up is much, much higher, okay? All right, one more thing. It's not yeah. a question. We just have a lot of happy birthday wishes for this week. Oh! <laughs> they know All you. All right, thank you, thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, yes. Uh, birthday will be on Friday. Yeah. Uh, the big four, 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 four <laughs> coming up uh, this Friday. So no, thank you everybody very, very much. All right. Okay, everybody. Well, I hope you enjoyed this hump day. Um, I hope the uh, the whole kind of uh, little talk on the fat physiology um, uh, makes it easier to understand. You know how and why uh, liposuction and fat transfer work. Um, and of course, uh, we will catch you all actually not next week because I'm going out for my birthday. Oh. So the week after. All right. We'll catch you all in two weeks on hump day with Dr. Alex Earl. Take care, everybody. Ciao. Beautiful.